Hello everyone, welcome and welcome back to my channel. I'm Min. Today I'd bring you a very special case, which is mentioned by. Thank you for the idea. This case happened in Taiwan, involving people from Hong Kong, and finally was used for this、um, extradition bill amendment. And the killer is extremely cruel. Like he folded the body up like a toy and stuffed it to a luggage, you know, torso and limbs go first, then the head. While he forcefully bent it to make it fit for the pink luggage they bought for the vacation. Moreover, during the trial, it caused quite a stir due to judicial issues. And my usual disclaimer about names and pronunciations. Because I can't correctly pronounce the Cantonese names, I will use Mandarin pronunciation for the people involved in this case. So, without further ado, let's dive into the story right away. Born in 1997, Pan Xiaoying comes from a pretty well-off family. She's the only daughter. And her dad is a wholesale distributor of Mitsubishi car parts in Hong Kong. Her parents totally spoiled her and once hooked her up with this fancy school in the Hong Kong Island District. But even though she's got looks for days, Pan Xiaoying just wasn't into academia. She ended up ditching secondary school in the fourth year and went for some vocational training instead. Like just like so many other girls, Pan Xiaoying was all about dressing up, taking selfies, going on dates, and sharing her life on social media. I'm not saying that's bad though. She'd often update her thoughts on relationships and her dating life on Facebook as well. She had a solid following of over four thousand people there. And emotion-wise, you know how it is when you are in your twenties, right? Sometimes you just easily get all sentimental and stuff because of youth, mostly. Anyway, back in 2016, she decided to spill the beans about her thoughts on love on Facebook. She made clear that she, like most girls, just wanted someone who treated her right. Fast forward a year later, she updated her relationship status and let everyone know that she was seeing this dude named Chen Tongjia. Guess what? She really meant it when she said she didn't care about her boyfriend's bank account. Chen Tongjia was like a year younger, and from a relatively more humble family than her. When the couple was head over heels for each other, their Facebook feeds were flooded with lovey-dovey content. They had both filled out the "About Me" section on their profiles with the romantic declaration, quoted. If you don't start, all be together forever. You know, something like that. During their passionate courtship, Pan Xiaoying even posted text saying, "He told me I'm his first and last girlfriend," and I can imagine a silly smile on her while she was publishing it to the Facebook. However, who would have thought this prophecy would come true? Although she may not have been Chen Tongjia's ultimate girlfriend. But Chen Tongjia indeed became her final boyfriend. Like a lot of young couples, when things were good, they were like living in a honey jar. But when they fought, it was like lighting explosives, flipping out over the tiniest things, arguing and making up. They kept going like this for more than six months. So on the eighth of February, twenty eighteen. Chen Tongjia and Pan Xiaoying headed over to Taiwan with the plan of having an epic Valentine's Day there. After having a super fun week exploring Taiwan, they hit up a red night market near their hotel and snagged a cool pink suitcase, getting ready to head back to Hong Kong the next day. Perhaps the excitement of sightseeing for a week had worn off. As they were getting ready to head home. Travel fatigue snicked up on them when they least expected it. That night, they were all cozy and snuggled up together at first. 
but like always, when they were chatting, they started arguing about silly things. Maybe because they retired from all the traveling, they were more annoyed and easily irritated than usual. The argument escalated from trivial matters to relationship problems, and it could be she wanted to provoke her boyfriend and won the argument. Pan Xiaoyin purposely told him that she was pregnant with her ex-boyfriend's baby, and Chen Tongjia got super upset about it. Already, right? He then later somehow discovered this、um, sex tape Pan Xiaoyin made with someone else. He snapped. Chen Tongjia, who was just twenty years old at the time, let his anger blind his mind. He grabbed her hair and slammed her head to the wall. Before strangling her to death on the floor, I can't even begin to describe how horrific that crime scene must be. She didn't get to spit another word before she miserably passed away. It just happened so fast. How ridiculous is that? You are in the middle of an argument with your partner, and yes, it was heated up to the extreme. But before you get to explain yourself further, your lover. Made a terrible change and went from a jealousy boyfriend to a ruthless murderer. <laughs> I get that people are impulsive, especially at young ages. However, I don't understand why some males, or let's just say,、um, physically stronger people, in situations of jealousy and argument, choose to attack their much weaker partners instead of、uh, just simply leaving the situation and taking time to cool down. This would allow both parties to have a sane and logical conversation later on, is it? It gives me the impression that these people are trying to gain an advantage by relying on their physical strength, which is unfair. Why can't some people get how vital it is to have an equal relationship, especially with people you care about? But like I mentioned. These two were barely twenty years old. It's that age when you started to understand some things, but not fully grasp them. So it's easy to react immaturely and impulsively to lots of situations. And it is no excuse to kill or attack someone. Anyway, what's done is done. Didn't want to get caught. Chen Tongjia shoved up that body into the cute pink. Suitcase they had bought together. Torso in, limbs in, and finally the head. The head was always poking out, and he couldn't close the luggage properly. Chen Tongjia was agitated, and he impatiently just pushed and tweaked the head just so it fits into the luggage, so that he could zip it up. Then he texted Pan Xiaoying's parents, trying to make weaker tones. And informed them that she would fly home the next morning. Well, Chen Dongjia checked out the hotel in the morning and left behind his girlfriend and their pink luggage before boarding the flight on the seventeenth of February, as he and his deceased girlfriend had planned for this trip. He took twenty-one hours from killing and packaging the body to ditching it. On the seventeenth of February, twenty eighteen, Pan Xiaoying's family was waiting for her to come home. Right? They received a message earlier in the morning stating that she will be in Hong Kong by noon. But her dad continued to check the flight information repeatedly and still saw no sign of his daughter. So, yeah, this this was pretty weird, right? Her family kept texting her and calling her, but they didn't hear back from her at all. However, you see, Pan Xiaoying's family always spoiled and indulged their daughter, so it wasn't uncommon for her to give someone the silent treatment over a small disagreement. Especially since she had initially lied to her parents about going on a tour group when she was actually traveling alone. With Chen Tongjia to Taiwan, of course, to avoid any drama involving their beloved daughter, her family didn't voice any objections about the trip when they discovered that she was with 
that guy. After all, they had already argued about her relationship with Chen Tongjia in the past. Pan Xiaoying's father never really liked Chen Tongjia from the first time they met, not necessarily because of his、um, ordinary family background, but more so because their daughter and him both seemed a mature in personality. As parents, they believed that their daughter, who was like a princess to them, needed someone with a more stable character. However, they couldn't change Pan Xiaoying's deep love for Chen Tongjia. They had already given advice and argued about it, but since the two couldn't be separated, they could just turn a blind eye off it, hoping she'd eventually wake up. So, like as always, Pan Xiaoying has been using her dad's joint credit card to cover her expenses in Taiwan, and then on the twentieth of February, three days after she was supposed to be back in Hong Kong. Her dad got a message from the bank saying that his credit card, the one Pan Xiaoying was using, had been used to withdraw eight thousand and five hundred Hong Kong dollar in Hong Kong. Pan Xiaoying's father couldn't understand how his daughter could have been back in Hong Kong without even coming home. He wondered if she had still been mad at the family and didn't want to come back for some reason. However, they hadn't even been. Arguing about her trip with Chen Tongjia, there's no way she'd be so mad that she wouldn't want to show up at home. The more he thought about it, the more something just didn't feel right. After waiting for what felt like ages, Pan Xiaoying's father couldn't take it anymore and decided to ask Chen Tongjia where the heck his daughter had disappeared to. Chen Tongjia was like super chill and yeah. Me and Pan Xiaoying had this massive fight, and we broke up in Taiwan, bro. I have no clue where she went. And when her dad saw how the state was acting or nonchalant, he was pissed off. And it just proved whatever he felt about him. You know, he always thought this guy was like very irresponsible. So he couldn't take it anymore. And Pan Xiaoying's dad finally went to the police and reported her missing in early March. The Hong Kong police checked Pan Xiaoying's immigration records and found out that she hadn't even returned to Hong Kong yet. So it seems like she's still on her way somewhere. After all, she's a legal adult now. Hong Kong changed the age of majority ordinance in 1990, making 18 the legal age of adulthood. They said. There's no need to worry too much. Of course, the police completely missed how strange it was that her father mentioned Pan Xiaoying withdrawing cash in Hong Kong, even though she shouldn't be there, according to the record. They didn't really think anything seriously illegal was going on, and probably assumed it was just a case of credit card theft or something similar. Seeing how the Hong Kong police didn't seem to care. Pan Xiaoying's dad got no choice but decided to fly to Taiwan and bring his girl back home. She might not be a big deal to other people, but she's their only child, and his little princess. It's been days without any contact. Any parent would be freaking worried, right? Since his daughter's spending in Taiwan was charged to his credit card, her father was able to locate the hotel she stayed at. Through the credit card records, so he of course wanted to check the hotel surveillance footage and found out where his daughter went on the twenty seventh of February, the day she stopped responding. Pan Xiaoying's father couldn't just show up and request to see the recordings, right? He had to file a police report. The Taiwan police were really responsible. Compared to the Hong Kong one, and they worry that the civilian footage might not be retained for long enough, considering she went missing on the seventeenth of February, and it was already eleventh of March, the day the father went for them. Hence, they immediately took the father to the hotel to get a CCTV footage after receiving this report. The civilian footage showed 
Pan Xiaoying and Chen Tongjia arriving at hotel together early morning on the 17th of February. And you can see that Chen Tongjia was carrying what looked like a light suitcase. However, the next day, the footage showed only him leaving, dragging the same suitcase that looked quite heavy. After checking the immigration records, Taiwan police confirmed Pan Xiaoying had not left Taiwan after entering this particular hotel on the 17th of February. What did this mean then? The answer was obvious. So the Taiwan police said that Pan Xiaoying was killed and they think this guy Chen Tongjia is super important to the case. And then they asked the Hong Kong police to arrest Chen Tongjia so they can check him out. On the 13th of March 2018, the dude Chen Tongjia got busted in Hong Kong, rocking a light blue t-shirt and black jacket. The cops found the victim Pan Xiaoying's ATM card on him. When they questioned him, he spilled the beans and admitted to offing Pan Xiaoying, stuffing her body in a suitcase and dinching it near the station in Taipei. Before he got nabbed that day, Chen Tongjia managed to sell um, Pan Xiaoying's Casio camera, iPhone 6, and exchanged her 20,000 New Taiwan dollar cash to Hong Kong dollar. According to him, he withdrew this amount in Taipei on the 17th of February after he did away with um, Pan Xiaoying. He was originally planning to buy some clothes with the cash but didn't have enough time to splurge before hightailing it back to Hong Kong. Wow, so he even wanted to go on shopping after he brutally killed his girlfriend. But he was a tourist there in Taiwan, so he apparently didn't know how to describe this exact spot where he left the body. Right? So the Taiwan police had to figure it out themselves. At 9.40pm on the 13th of March, the Taiwan police did a thorough search and stumbled upon Pan Xiaoying's dead body, all decomposed after 25 days out in the open, chilling under a tree outside the station. Thanks to the sun and rain, the body was super gross and falling apart, with bones sticking out and stuff. Later on, the forensic team found a little 2cm bone fragment and some unknown DNA in her rotting belly, confirming that she was almost 3 months pregnant when she got killed. Upon hearing the news of his daughter's murder, Pan Xiaoying's father was devastated and couldn't control his emotions. He kept telling his friends that he didn't really like Chen Tongjia, but he couldn't stop the young couple from being together. And when the police were still searching for the body, Pan Xiaoying's father visited his famous temples in Taipei, praying for a quick resolution to the case. When people are extremely sad, they may want some emotional support. As we, Chinese people, deeply influenced by Buddhist thoughts, perhaps seeking comfort from Buddha can obtain some solace and salvation from endless pain. I guess her father must not understand why it was his own daughter who suffered misfortune. Why he couldn't be there to help his daughter when she needed it. Why couldn't he be more persistent to separate the couple? Why? There are many passives and regrets, but he cannot confine it anyone except the Buddha. When Pan Xiaoying's mother arrived in Taipei on the 15th of March for DNA confirmation, a Taiwanese reporter asked her if the perpetrator's parents had apologized and if she had anything to say. Her mother chose not to respond. In fact, Chen Tongjia's parents never made any public statement about the case, even though it caused a huge uproar in Hong Kong society. There was a photo of Chen Tongjia's father in a Hong Kong tabloid, where he was seen throwing away a large bag of girls' items shortly after the case was revealed. The bag contained unused girls' underwear, hair accessories, dolls, and Chen Tongjia does not have any sisters. So these would be belonged to whom, I guess we all know. 
after the incident. Some Hong Kong media portrayed Pan Xiaoying as being unfaithful, but her friends told other outlets that the couple was actually very loving. The friends all remember Pan Xiaoying was super excited about her trip to Taiwan, and she was so nice and wanted to bring souvenirs for her friends. I just don't get why it feels like our culture doesn't have respect for women's emotional and private lives, especially when it comes to female victims. It's like some people always try to find these so-called valid reasons for why they were victimized, and then everyone automatically assumes that the victims must have done something wrong to deserve it. Now, some might argue that the media is at fault for using these. Attention-grabbing headlines. What if we didn't have this nosy curiosity? These headlines and stories wouldn't get popular, and there wouldn't be all this mean-spirited speculation about victims. Normally, in my storytelling videos, after recounting the details of the crimes, I would proceed to discuss the. Trial verdicts for the perpetrator. However, in the seemingly straightforward case of violence with an identified murder suspect, proper justice could not be served in court. You see, he is from Hong Kong, but committed crime in Taiwan. In terms of their legislative systems, Hong Kong and Taiwan operate differently. In Taiwan. Their criminal laws allows for prosecuting crimes committed within Taiwan and serious crimes committed by Taiwanese individuals abroad. On the other hand, Hong Kong operates under territorial jurisdiction. This means that if a crime is committed by a Hong Kong resident outside of Hong Kong, it cannot be prosecuted. As a result of this difference, Chen Tongjia was only arrested and detained for theft. On the 13th of March 2018 in Hong Kong, while the Taiwan police found the body, and because the murder charge was related to an incident in Taiwan, Hong Kong did not have the authority to try him for it. After more than a year of investigation, questioning, and waiting for trial, even if Chen Tongjia is found totally guilty of theft, he would only have to spend around. 1.5 to two years in jail in Hong Kong. On the 3rd of December 2018, Taiwan police issued an arrest warrant for Chen Tongjia for the alleged murder in Taiwan, stating that he could be arrested according to the law if he enters Taiwan, with a statute of limitations of 37.5 years for prosecution. Throughout Chen Tongjia's trial. The Taiwan police kept asking Hong Kong to extradite him for trial in Taiwan, but they claimed that Hong Kong did not respond and chose to sentence him first for theft in Hong Kong. In April 2019, Hong Kong's Department of Justice charged Chen Tongjia with money laundering for alleged misusing his girlfriend's bank card and other things. The High Court sentenced him to 29 months in prison in Hong Kong. Nothing about the murder. Well, like I said, they couldn't charge him with the murder there in Hong Kong, and he was released from prison on the 23rd of October 2019 at 9 a.m. after serving his sentence, literally four years ago. So, like during the investigation of the case in Hong Kong, Taiwan's Ministry of Justice. Reached out to Hong Kong authorities, hoping to get Chen Tongjia's DNA to send to Taiwan for some testing to see if he was the dad of Pan Xiaoying's unborn baby. But like I said in the beginning, that this case stirred up some political bullshit. Therefore, this crucial evidence, which could clarify the suspect's motivations and charges, was ultimately disregarded. And after Chen Tongjia was released, he actually announced publicly that he wanted to turn himself in to Taiwan. He said he was sorry and felt he deserved whatever the punishment Taiwan may give. But he never made his trip from Hong Kong to Taiwan. Well, up until I made this video, why? 
The reason behind this is complex, but I will do my best to explain it in the simplest way possible. According to reports from various Hong Kong media on the 16th of February 2021, Peter Kuhn, who is a chaplain, has been assisting Chen Tongjia in his surrender. He said that Chen Tongjia is totally up for surrendering himself in Taiwan, but those Taiwan authorities are being a buzzkill and haven't issued him an entry visa or given a positive response for him to get there. Peter Kuhn thought the trickiest part would be conceiving Chen Tongjia to agree to go to Taiwan to surrender, but man, he never imagined in his wildest dreams that the real challenge would be Taiwan not being done to give him a visa. You see, Taiwan closed its border to non-residents due to the COVID-19 pandemic back then. It was 2021, but it's 2023 when the mainland China has released the pandemic control. Hopefully, we will see some updates in the future. And if there are any, I will make sure to pin them to the comment section in this video. And there is another reason for the stalling. The politicians from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland China escalated this murder case to a political level. And you must be as confused as I am to why is there the appearance of mainland China politicians? Well, what can I say? China wants Taiwan and Taiwan doesn't want China. So I will leave this matter to some other historical channels. Check it out if you're interested. Back to the case itself is that because there is no extradition treaty between Hong Kong and Taiwan, and if the Hong Kong government sent Chen Tongjia to Taiwan, they need to change their extradition bill, right? And if they changed it, it allowed them to send criminal suspects across a ton of places like Taiwan and mainland China. So that's why all the politicians went crazy about the amendment. As you see, Chen Tongjia as a murderer should be sent, but what about other suspects? Especially these people who got jailed because of political reasons. Therefore, the protests in Hong Kong 2019 to 2020 happened. Chen Tongjia could never have imagined that after killing, dumping the body, and taking the victim's stuff, he could just get away with it and avoid punishment, and actually benefit from most from all those chaos that followed. You must be familiar with the trolley problem. There is a runaway trolley barreling down the railway tracks. Here, there are two paths it could take. On one path, there is just one person on the tracks. On the other, there are many people. Which path do you choose for the trolley to take? Even if someone has made up their mind to choose the single person path, you know, the needs of many await the needs of the few. They are looking for more trouble. As when we apply this problem in Hong Kong regarding Chen Tongjia's case and other criminal suspects. You don't even know which path contains the least people. The convicted criminals or those wrongfully accused. <laughs> now you see why Hong Kong recalled a plan to change the extradition bill. This is likely just another example of why politicians can be so unlikable. No matter the case, they will exploit it if there is anything for them to gain. From their perspectives, there may only be a vague understanding of collective interest. They might not even be able to hear the cries of each individual who is suffering. Or perhaps they can hear them but choose to ignore them since it's not happening to themselves. Anyway, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe, so I will see you in my next video.